So, welcome to this session, which, as Katerina mentioned, is called Let the Gap Be Your Map. Uh, and I'll leave the floor, or I'll introduce to the floor, uh, Ellen Larson, the current program director for Resource, who will introduce and explain the theme of this next hour. Welcome. Very Thank nice you. to see you. Thank you. If you want to take a slot I'll here. I'll take a slot here. It's all yours. <laughs> Thank you. A warm welcome to our session, Let the Gap Be Your Map. So, Resource is a Swedish strategic innovation program that's funded by the Swedish energy agency, Vinova and Farmas. Our vision is to create a sustainable use of materials within the planetary boundaries. And our, the main focus of our work is to fund innovation projects and as well as projects gathering new facts to create knowledge. How we use materials has a huge impact on the planet. Resource extraction and processing accounts for almost 50% of the global carbon dioxide emissions and almost 90% of the loss of biodiversity. IPCC was able to state for the first time in its report in April this year that circular materials flows are a prerequisite for the industry to achieve its ambitions to fulfill the Paris Agreement. But to address circularity in the right way, we need to know where we stand today and to be able to measure change over time. And that's why Resource uh, decided to fund the Circularity Gap Report for Sweden so that we have a reference value. We are living in a complex world world, we are dealing with complex questions and those needs to be simplified so that they are easier to comprehend, so that we can get everyone on board and get everyone moving in the same directions. I recently listened to a PhD and a uh, psychologist that talked about transformation and what it takes to create change. They said that 40 to 50% of change can come from being able to choose a different product or a different service. But the rest is up to us and our ability to change. And for that, we might need a uh, common vision to understand what that new life could look like. And that's also something that is described in the Circularity Gap Report that states six future scenarios for different sectors that challenge the status quo. One interesting point that was also made out by the two is that we need to allow people to have the sense of loss of what might be taken away from them in this new world and let people grieve that loss. It's time for a new kind of leadership, a leadership that is curious, brave, but also humble. So let's start this session with having a look at this short introduction film for, uh, to the Circularity Gap Report, Sweden.
Well, that was super. Thank you very much indeed, Ellen. Um, we're now going to go over to Matthew Fraser of the Circle Economy. I came across the Circle Economy a couple of years ago. They're doing amazing reports in this whole area of the circular economy, both global but also national reports to do. Now, Matthew, you've worked in the field of circular economy for over 10 years, advising businesses, cities and national governments. And Matthew is also in charge of setting Circle Economy's research agenda and is leading the Circularity Gap Reporting Initiative. It's really lovely to see you. I think we've got a seven-minute presentation and a bit of a PowerPoint too. Super. Great. Over to you. Thank you very much. Well, it's really my honor to be here today and uh, actually to get to share some of the key results out of the, the report that we've done together with RISE and Resource. It's been a fantastic collaboration. Getting into the the main point, how circular is Sweden? Um, we found that Sweden is 3.4% circular. And what does that mean? That means really that 96% of all resources that Sweden is consuming as a nation are coming from virgin sources. Now, how does that compare to other countries, the rest of the world, it sits definitely below the global average of 8.6, um, but actually quite comparable to uh, neighboring nations like Norway at 2.4, or even other regions of the world like Quebec in Canada at 3.5. Now, that's not really surprising when you consider the character of Sweden's economy. It's um, definitely quite active in key uh, extractive industries like uh, forestry and mining. But I think there's another big part of this story that um, Sweden consumes um, one, one of the largest total material footprints uh, in the world. In fact, Sweden is the fourth largest consumer of materials in the world. And I think that really has a, a key part to play in the, the, the gap metric that we see here. I think what we need, and I think actually the, uh, the, one of the key benefits that circular economy offers is really a systemic solution to addressing how we use material resources in our society. Um, and as Ellen mentioned, we've crafted six uh, societal level scenarios that really look at you know, fundamentally how can we use resources better in our needs for housing, nutrition, mobility, goods and services. Um, I'd love to just be able to walk through just a few examples of those today. Um, looking at construction, and there's a huge amount of innovation that's already happening, and many of the speakers have, have, have touched on some of these great innovations. What we found is that if we first prioritize demo, uh, demolition and um, repair over um, new build, what we can see is that um, already the material footprint of, of, of Sweden could go down by a total of 10%. Also, the circularity metric that I mentioned before could be boosted by 40% just through those two, two priorities, to the, through those two design decisions. Also, we've heard a lot about nutrition today uh, and the global agricultural system. We've also looked at strategies for making Sweden's food system more regenerative by nature, but also looking at how we can systematically reduce waste. Not only are there really clear benefits for the circularity metric and the material footprint again, but also quite clearly big impacts on uh, emissions, on livelihoods, uh, and biodiversity. So this is also a really sort of win-win-win scenario that we've looked into. And finally, looking at manufacturing, system uh, systematically looking at how not only we can boost the use of secondary materials in manufacturing, but also looking at how we can really enable circular business models through leasing, repair, remanufacturing. What we found again is just through this one strategy, we could reduce again, the material footprint of Sweden by another 10%, uh, while also boosting that circularity metric by about 7%. So these are all really big numbers. We have another three scenarios that I didn't even touch on, um, but I think it's, it's really powerful. What does this all mean if we kind of zoom out and, and look at, you know, what if we were to enable a circular economy today? And in fact, that's the kind of modeling that we do. It's a sort of what if modeling. Um, what we've seen is actually all of those strategies, all of those scenarios combined together, Sweden could reduce its material footprint by over 42%. That's almost half. 
while also boosting the circularity metrics that I mentioned before, well over double. So the power of the circular economy enacted at a societal level is, is really significant, really huge. And we've also painted quite a clear picture of how that not only changes the material picture, but how that influences the environment in terms of emissions, but also how that could also influence things like innovation in the economy, jobs, and so forth. Um, it's really fantastic um, to get the chance to present those results uh, today. Uh, and I think obviously fast tracking uh, the transition toward a circular economy would be uh, a, a key action for, for governments both in Sweden, but both uh, at the global level. Thank you very much. Matthew, thank you. And I, as I say, I love the work that Circular Economy is doing. I think it's really fantastic. And um, I was quite shocked, though, because Sweden's like 3.4 or something like that. You mentioned Norway. We always think of these countries as being the front runners. But then globally, it's 8.6. So who's boosting the numbers upwards? Um, yeah, so it, it really does. Um, so a big part of this analysis really looks at the character of uh, each economy. And, and, and Sweden, as I mentioned, has a large extractive industry. Right. It also consumes a lot. It's, it's a rich nation. Um, there's a lot of uh, consumption per capita. Mm -hmm. If you look at other parts of the world, namely the global south, um, what you see is, is, is much of the opposite picture. Consumption is way down. And while there still may be uh, some very specific extractive industries, mm -hmm. the economy actually looks quite different. So right. there, there is a bit of a balancing effect. Right, globally. so there's some extra circularity in the developing countries versus the big, rich countries. Well, also considering that many countries in the global south, um, the, the, the share of, let's say, bio-based materials is, is way higher. So yeah. there's also th that really playing into the metric. Right, right, right. And I understand the Netherlands are doing a good job. There's a bit of a, a standout yeah. there in the <laughs> European scene. The Netherlands is a front runner. I think uh, we've calculated that to be just around 25% circular just after right. that. So. Is there any coincidence to the fact that you're headquartered in the Netherlands <laughs> uh, and that you've actually managed to... Maybe you need to be headquartered in Sweden. It'll go faster. Yeah. I mean, we have a great relationship with the Dutch government, but uh, by no means was that influencing the number. Okay. And lastly, um, I mean, I think we all sense that the circular economy is the next frontier that we have to go through if we're going to truly deal with the big challenges we have right now and bring sustainable development everywhere. Um, we shouldn't give up when we see these low numbers, yeah? Yeah. No, certainly not. I, I, I think the, the real change actually comes in the... The, the magnitude of change. So yeah. again, I think the, the key message that I would highlight here is Sweden could almost uh, reduce its total material footprint yeah. by half and well over double the, uh, the, the circularity rate. So okay. big news. Okay, yeah. great, super. Thank you very much indeed. Thank if you very much. This way. All right, uh, now we are hoping to go to um, Karina Kalman, who is with the Research Institutes of Sweden, to talk about buildings, because they're really a big part of the story. I've got a suspicion, Karina, that you may have somebody else with you. Yes, he's over here. Jolly good, Magnus. So, Magnus, um, I don't actually have you in the script here, but I was told you were coming. So, where are you from, Magnus? Are you also with the Research Institutes of Sweden? That is right. I'm a okay. communicator. I'm a vice president at RISE, and I'll be giving this talk together with Karina today. Actually. That's absolutely fantastic. Good. We've cleared that all up. We're all very happy. Um, yeah, maybe uh, you could tell us a little bit about your work with buildings, right? What, what is happening here in Sweden with the circular economy and, and the estates, mm -hmm. as we say? Yeah, so today we'll be giving a talk about two really exciting districts uh, where there's a lot happening in the Stockholm area. So we call the city district arenas, where we're trying to drive innovation and really accelerating change. And, and uh, I'll give you some examples very soon here. But what does the future hold? And here we're talking really about how are we going to transform the construction sector and how are we going to build in the future? And we believe that we have to do this in partnership really to boost innovation. Uh, we need to work together with really clever people in a transdisciplinary way, uh, really to, to look at, at complex challenges in the most holistic view that we can. And also we are looking into creating uh, co-creation hubs uh, where we can erase corporate borders and really sit together, think together and work together. We really believe that silos are stupid. And what is then the opposite of silos? Well, we try to think that uh, we can bring great minds together. And, and really that is the uh, excellent way to boost access to excellent, um, 
respects also for that part and technology. And I'm not saying that we're going to involve all of these different, different disciplines here, but we have the possibility of doing that. And just the possibility of doing that really makes you think, uh, not, not in a silo way, but think really, what can we do together with uh, maybe AI researchers or uh, people working with circular transition, uh, so food tech, you name it. So really exciting. And what, what do we then mean when we talk about city district arenas? Well, we're going to give you two examples. And here I'm going to let my colleague Karina in, in the presentation. Oh, thank you very much, Kamangas. Well, uh, there are many good examples for work uh, for sustainable change on the way, but by connecting them and creating synergies, we will go further and faster. We use empirical knowledge as a basis for organizational learning and innovation in sustainable urban development. This form for, <clears throat> forms the basis for future policy development and governance models for sustainable change, which we call climate city governance in response to the EU's climate city mission. It involves the public sector, business, academy and citizens. So, oh, I missed the slide. Uh, by using the district as an innovation area, we can try new solution on a large scale and gain insight and then replicate. The Sikla district, a part of the Stockholm Green Innovation District, is one example. Here we work with synergies of systems. Uh, parts uh, of the sustainable work is led by the citizens themselves here in the built, already built environment. And, and at the same time, the public and business community are leading the way with innovation around what is going to be built. By using the power of citizens, citizen driven in, initiatives bottom up and combining it with sustainable work and governance from above, we can get an accelerated movement. And here we can find good examples and spread them to other districts where knowledge and sustainable solutions are re reused and further developed. In this way, synergies are reached both horizontally and vertical in society for maximum impact. And then we go to uh, Valparaiso. It's another district. Uh, it's a large scale port area which, which will be transformed into a vibrant and sustainable district with housing. And by early activation, activation of, of the area with things that signal and encourage sustainable lifestyle, the foundation is laid, laid, for, uh, laid for a climate smart district. Here, a lifelong learning is the key, showing that we do not actually have all the answers and solutions today to meet the climate goals, but we learn together and everyone's everyone's contribution is uh, important. One way to articulate and include more stakeholders in the work is through real-time labs. Here we can draw, draw conclusions by evaluating various solutions in a scientific way. This will give us guidelines and valuable keys for both climate and human well-being in the city. So silos not, is not the future and the collaboration is a very, very important. That is the main uh, message from us. Super. Um, okay, so what you're basically saying is, if I can understand exactly, is that these various projects that you mentioned, and there's probably a hell of a lot more, are going to become <laughs> incubators or test beds for how to develop circular economy communities. And from the learning that you get in these very different kinds of places, is this right? You've got a port area, you've got another kind of area. You can basically bring these forward to the rest of Sweden and hopefully to other parts of the Nordic region and the world, maybe even, uh, to basically show what can be done in terms of fast forwarding circularity in, in urban areas. Is this the idea? Yeah, that's correct. Good. 
so I was right. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your presentation. That's very thank interesting you. indeed. Thank you very much for being with us, both of you. Thank you. All thank right, you. we're now going to move to uh, Maria Smith, who is, uh, just get the camera up a little bit, thank you. Uh, Maria Smith, who's the Acting Secretary General of the Axe Foundation. And this is a standalone, non-profit organisation developing practical solutions to complex sustainability challenges. And I've got a feeling, Maria, you might be talking about food. So why don't you come on down here to our wonderful stage? Thank you. You have a keynote and there's the camera. Perfect. Super. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I will talk about food and I will give you uh, three of our innovative projects uh, in just a short while. First, I will just give you a flavor of who we are at Axe Foundation. And I want to link to a statement that was actually printed in the um, Circular Gap report that says that the time for transformational change is now. And I can just say that Axe Foundation, uh, at Axe Foundation, we totally agree. So who are we? Well, we call ourselves a do tank rather than a think tank, since we are extremely, extremely focused on doing, on testing, on experimenting, on really trying to find and um, develop uh, sustainable innovations for uh, transformational change. And like uh, you heard, we actually uh, develop practical solutions together with others. And we always work together with academia research, always together with business and entrepreneurs, and often also in broad coalitions. The target with our projects and our solutions is to actually create real change and change that can contribute to a transform transformative change. And one way of doing that is that we are, instead of being customer centric, which a lot of organizations talk about, we're actually problem oriented and problem centric. And that sounds a bit dull and dry, I know. But we're far from that, because what we have realized that in order to really find the good solutions, you have to understand the problem. So we're really trying hard to understand the pro problem and digging into that in our operations. And right now we run about 30 projects together with 200 partners within the areas of sustainable consumption and production, future food and circular economy. And I will give you just a short introduction to, to three of those projects. Uh, one of them is Minst Bream. And what kind of problem do we want to solve with this project? Well, actually today in Sweden, we consume foremost predatory fish from the Swedish lakes. And since we do so, we also mainly fish predator predatory fish from these lakes. And for each kilo, kilo of predatory fish, we get four kilos of bycaught fish, an untapped resource that is, at least earlier, sent back to the lake. And while we're having this untapped resource, we import 70% of the seafood that is consumed in Sweden. There's a systemic a problem here, as, as, as long as we saw it at least. So what we decided is, uh, we want to find a solution to this. And together with a bunch of partners, with the county of Stockholm, with of course the fish industry, Grönsakshallen and, and several more, we decided to actually create and develop infrastructure for this underutilized fish. Uh, and also create a business case for the fishermen in order for them to earn money on these untapped resources. And to make a long story short, uh, last summer uh, we actually could introduce this green listed minst bream, which is um, uh, braxen in Swedish. Um, and we could actually introduce that, so now it's available in food service uh, sector, which means restaurants and some public kitchens. Uh, another example I would like to highlight a project that is ongoing right now. It's the Swedish Wool Initiative that was initiated with, 
of one of our partners, Filippa K. And the problem that we want to solve with this project is to actually uh, look into the problem that we have right now of actually discarding 50% of the wool produced in Sweden. And at the same time, while we discard half of the produced wool, we import large volumes of wool to Sweden. And so together with the fashion industry and the outdoor industry, we have Tiger, Flippa K, Fjällräven, of course the wool industry, the wool collectors and the sheep industry. We're now looking into establishing conditions that um, actually makes Swedish wool competitive and also a circular resource for the fashion and outdoor industry. And the vision of that project is to make sure that 0% of the Swedish wool goes to waste in the future. Last but not least, uh, the last project I would just like to highlight, it's a project that we called five tons of green fish in the counter. It sounds better in Swedish, fem ton grön fiskedisk. Uh, it's where we actually try to address the problem of having 85% of the commercial fish stocks being either overused or used to its, ma to its max. Uh, because in order to solve that problem, it is said that farmed fish will hopefully be one of the solutions. But there is a but with farmed fish, and that is the feed. Because today, farmed fish mostly get fed through soy, cereals or wild-caught fish. And the, these three are food that we as humans can eat. And we don't believe that our feed are supposed to eat our food. Our food should not eat our food. So instead, we wanted to find a circular insect-based feed, which we also did last year. So we had vegetable leftovers, we gave them to insects, the insects were produced as feed, and then Eldos Lux produced farmed fish. And next step, because we made this prototype last year, will hopefully be for pigs and poultry as well, so to find that circle of feed for uh, other uh, types of protein as well. Three examples from Asterax Foundation. Yeah, really interesting. And what I thought was fascinating was with the first one, how quickly it came to market. Yes. <laughs> because most innovations, you know, take years, right? You have an idea, yeah. you do something, and then, yeah, 25 years later, maybe it happens, you know? So I thought that was really good. Um, the, I presume quite small scale projects in a sense, uh, and that's okay. But how do you then move to this big scaling up? Would it be other projects that you might have in the pipeline? Uh, other ideas? Um, yeah. No, yeah. but I, I, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I don't agree with that we only have small scale. The ones right. I showed you now are a bit small scale. And I think they have to be in the start mm -hmm. because if you are to do new things that no one has ever done before, mm -hmm. you, at least we, we want to sort of move quickly into testing, experimenting, iterating solutions. Mm -hmm. And then when we find a solution, that's sort of when you want to scale it up. You can't start believing that you have the best solution from day one and going big, because then you will make, waste money and time. Instead, I think you should be small in the beginning, really mm -hmm. fast moving and then scale up. And we have examples of that. I didn't bring any of those because they are sort of hey. behind us. <laughs> no, no, I mean, small is beautiful as well. And we yeah. know what Schum yeah. the Schumacher School does in Britain and, uh, and so on. So no, small is important too, because what you can do is demonstrate quickly that something actually can go circular yeah. and then it can be scaled up either by yourselves or by others in, in other sectors of the economy. I think that was really interesting. And I think it's, it's fascinating that, um, also, the, 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 the vision of understanding the circularity of the Swedish economy can be an empowering uh, piece of information to say, aha, we can change things around. There's loads of opportunities out there. And, and I'm so pleased that after years and years and years and years and years of talking about the circular economy, it's now starting to get the attention it deserves. And I hope it gets more attention at COP27 in so Egypt and the other key international fora. Thank you very much for your time. That thank was great. You. Thank okay, you. Thank you. And thanks to all our other guests. Yes, let's give them a big uh, round of applause and a big round of applause from the digital audience out there, which is about 5 million or so, I think, as we speak. Um, let me hand over to my 
colleague Katarina, where we're going to look at textiles. Thank you so much, Nick. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Well, textiles is a huge consumer goods sector that uses up massive amounts of water and also raw materials like wood pulp and cotton. And the process pollutes and emits climate gases. But change is coming both in production and also among consumers with circularity in focus. Let's start by watching a video about this. Have you noticed that lots of things go around in circles? Seems so natural, doesn't it? After all, that's how it's worked for billions of years. Until we lost track. We need to go circular again, before we reach the end of the line. For us, circularity is about ending ways to reduce humanity's impact so that people everywhere can prosper. The new cell recycles textiles by breaking down cotton in worn out clothes and putting it back together again. At our new home in Sundsvall, we're recycling a paper production line and going big. For the first time, billions of worn-out clothes can be made into new clothing at a scale that really makes a difference. Right here. With expertise like this, we're leading a global industry back to circularity. And now a panel discussion with four experts in this field. Please welcome here in the studio Patrick Lundström, CEO of RenewCell, and Felicia Rotersvärd, a sustainability, sustainability manager at H&M Sweden. And with us on Zoom, we have Stephen Bethel. He's co-founder uh, of Bank and Vogue and co-founder of Beyond Retro Label. And also we have with us Gwen Cunningham, leads in who leads the textile program at Circle Economy. And there you are, wonderful to have you with us, Gwen, and also, also have, the, uh, have, have also Stephen with us. And please join us, Felicia and Patrick. Please take a seat in the sofa. I'm gonna sit in this chair so I can watch the Zoom friends we have with us here, the Zoom experts. So, wonderful to see you. Hi. Thank you. Welcome to the studio here. Uh, I'd like to start with a question for you, Gwen. Um, how about redesigning fashion from a circularity perspective? What is happening here? <laughs> yeah, we have to redesign uh, everything. Mm -hmm. um, it is a design challenge and that's why it fascinates me. I'm a designer by trade, that's my background. Um, and I often, you know, I often think of, I think the, the fashion industry is kind of the poster child uh, for the linear economy, you know, in that it operates in almost an entirely take, make, use, waste uh, model. You know, taking vast volumes of, of resources, water, energy, uh, to produce fibers, fabrics, materials at a, at a huge scale. And um, then of course, making huge volumes of product. We know that we passed a incredible and kind of devastating number a few years ago, where now we make over a hundred billion new items of clothing per year. Um, numbers we can't even comprehend, you know, but you have to remind ourselves that we have 7.9 billion people on the planet and then 100 billion new items of clothing per year. And then, of course, using product for an increasingly short amount of time. We know that clothing utilization is really taking a nosedive in the past, the past decades. And then, of course, you've got that waste phase, which has always been what fascinated me the most as a designer. I think it was Jonathan Chapman, one of my heroes, who said that, uh, yeah, that waste is nothing more than the failed relationship between a product and the consumer. And again, that strikes me as a bit of a design challenge. How can we redesign the kind of context and the conditions of that relationship to design out waste from the outset? And then, of course, waste, we'll see later when we look at the other panelists and the work that they're doing, but there are so many different types and profiles of waste from post-industrial factory clipping waste um, at a manufacturing stage through to that pre-consumer waste, the, the dead stock, the defect, the return goods. It's kind of the dirty little secret of the industry that we don't talk about as nearly as much as we should. And then post-consumer waste, what you and I, you know, say goodbye to. 
Um, and the vast majority of that, of course, is, you know, being landfilled or incinerated, often not even collected. In Northwest Europe, 70% of post-consumer waste is just going into the regular household textile bin and being lost in the system. So we have this, this, it is a design flaw in and of itself, the linear system. And then, of course, it's in a kind of a hyper acceleration mode right now. We are seeing this, especially in fashion, you know, between 2000 and 2014, garment production doubled and the average consumer is buying now 60% more, but also keeping their product for half as long as they used to. So that's, that's more stuff being made, more stuff being consumed and then quicker to that end of use uh, phase. And of course, all of that uh, comes with impact. And I think we're now realizing more and more the link between this linear system and especially um, climate. Um, so for instance, we saw recently, I think about a year ago now, the McKinsey report telling us that the fashion sector uh, in 2018 was responsible for about 4% of global uh, emissions. And that's the same or the equivalent of the economy of, of Germany, of the UK and of France combined. And it also made a really clear and, and quite powerful point that, you know, if we want to stay within that 1.5 degree pathway that's been set out for us by the IPCC, we are going to have to really, uh, you know, cut those emissions by 1.1 billion metric tons of CO2 equivalent by 2030. But with the current growth trajectory of the industry, because we are growing, um, we are set to outpace and to overshoot that target mm. by almost twofold. So we are, in many ways, you know, we're heading in, in quite a stark wrong direction. So there is an urgency to change and to redesign the way we, uh, you know, design, the way we produce, the way we sell, the way we use, and the way we dispose of textiles. And that is a is a design challenge. Um, so when we talk about circularity for textiles, what, what does it mean? Well, it means making a switch in our raw materials towards renewable, towards recyclable, towards safe inputs. Um, and of course, we're going to hear later on about how that's happening with new textile to textile, high value textile to textile recycling, which is a very uh, exciting space at the moment. Mm. But materials are, are not going to cut it, materials alone. We also need to design our products so that they have that end of use or that end of life moment already in mind so that we are anticipating how and what could be the barriers to extended life, to repair, to reuse, to recycling. And as designers, we're designing out those barriers from the outset. So that's designing for durability whether that's physical durability, emotional durability, designing for recyclability. And this is obviously something that brands have a lot of influence over. And then we have to also build the business model, build the system mm -hmm. to ensure that those products are in fact actually kept in use, kept in the system. And that's where you get to things like resale, like rental, um, and these new emergent circular business models, which of course have a potential to you know, increase that utilization that I spoke about before. So make sure that we're really making best use of the products that we have in the system. But also the big intention there is that over time, we're gonna displace the need for new production and for new consumption. And that is really key because one of the big challenges we have in this industry is volume. And we need to start looking at that elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And then all of the above, I think it always bears mentioning, all of the above has to happen in such a way that we're not only keeping materials functioning at their highest potential, at their highest value, but we're also keeping the people along the value chain uh, functioning and thriving at their highest potential. So it needs to be built to be a, a just and an equitable circular system, which I think uh, we need to constantly keep top of mind. So this is, this is a design challenge. And I think rightly so, you said, you know, we're seeing a big shift at the moment away from an understanding of, of why is it needed towards how do we get there? So we've got, you know, great movement happening within the industry with, you know, the, the uh, UN fashion charter, with the G7 fashion pact, with many, many pilots that are, you know, gradually coming more to scale. We also have movements at policy. We saw the, the EU strategy being released in March, which holds huge promise and also hopefully can be a bit of a, a stick in the mud or a, 
a kind of a point for other um, other countries to look at as also a, an inspirational case. Um, but yes, we, we need to kind of hurry up because the other yeah. precious resource that we don't Indeed. have in great abundance is time. Mm. Um, mm. So we really need to, to drive this change quicker. And I think that's, you know, speaking from my part with the textiles program and circular economy, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to move uh, towards the practical implementation of the circular economy. And for us, it's all around reducing the existing textile waste mountain that we have uh, by kind of building up the technology, the data, the infrastructure that we need to valorize that waste stream, but also at the same time proactively um, preventing textile waste from happening. And that's through circular design and through circular business models. Thank so a huge so challenge um, and one that's going to take collective action on Absolutely. a scale that maybe seems mm. utopic huge. or seems yeah. unfeasible mm. um, to many. But I think we have great examples here in the room today that shows yes. that Thank it you. is possible and it is happening and we just need to uh, go further and go faster at this stage. Thank you very much, Gwen. We'll move on to the other experts here. Uh, thank you for setting the th setting the scene here. Uh, Stephen, you are a co-founder of Beyond Retro, which is a big, <laughs> big uh, brand in terms of uh, vintage and, and secondhand. And uh, would you agree with me when I say that vintage and, and secondhand is really increasingly becoming mainstream and uh, more than a trend? Yeah, and let me uh, let me back up by saying because uh, you know and I, I, you never want these panels to be a love fest. So I'm going to take the issue with the word uh, waste. You know, secondhand garments are not waste. What they are is a real opportunity in front of us. And uh, when you walk into a Beyond Retro, whether it be on Drottengatten or in Trangla, um, really, I like the the words that Gwen used, which is a motive. Um, you know, I, I think that for sure there's an, an insurgence right now um, of, uh, and we're happy to see more and more customers in Stockholm uh, donning the doors of Beyond Retro. Uh, you know, we just opened a new store in, uh, in Uppsala last week. Uh, we've opened four stores uh, within the last 12 months in Sweden, uh, you know, with the confidence that that Swedish customer, the customer is is loving our offering. And it's not just a small segment of super trendy people that are doing it. You'll see amazing, um, you know, some 70 plus year old lady who's going out to a cocktail party will don our doors to get a sparkly dress. And so for us, this, that's, that's an amazing moment. And, and really, I think a, a great uh, flag for uh, vintage secondhand uh, reuse is, is shining a really bright light in, in the city of Stockholm in, at Beyond Retro. So, um, you know, I, is it a trend? Is it, it people are aware of it? I think people walk in and see value in what we're doing, and, I, and I'm ex I'm excited about it. Mm -hmm. And it's not waste. It's it's another opportunity for 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 another night out in a beautiful e evening party on on a on a dress. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Let's turn to Patrick uh, Renusel. We saw your short video here. Um, how about the circularity of materials? Give us a sort of flyover what's happening here and what, what it holds, what promises it holds to be able to break down the textile fibers and make something new. Yeah, first and foremost, I'd like to, <clears throat> to explain that we uh, I fully agree with the uh, former speakers. I mean, we know our place in the value chain here. <clears throat> we agree that you know we should use our clothes longer. Mm -hmm. uh, we should also uh, use it for second hand. But eventually, clothes are going to be uh, so discarded or so damaged or out of fashion that nobody wants it. And that's where we come in. We create circularity in the fashion industry. So what we do is we take uh, uh, cellulose rich textiles, which is uh, uh, cotton or or viscose type of materials. Uh, so your old jeans, my old jeans, all of your old jeans. Yep. And we take that into our, <clears throat> our production, we shred it down, and uh, we make a dissolving pulp out of that. That dissolving pulp we then sell to, uh, to, for, for viscous mills to make new fabrics. And then we can actually make new clothes out of that. Uh, that feels new. And uh, uh, customers can buy it with, with a clear conscience. So, um, you know, it's a... It's an, in, uh, an, an existing technology, uh, but the novelty lies in that we are able to make um, the solving pulp out of 100% uh, cotton. We don't use, we don't cut down any trees mm. in order to do uh, uh, the dissolving pulp. 
So how are you collaborating with SIPTEX? I know there's a, I'm from Malmö, this <laughs> a city in Malmö where we have the SIPTEC factory, mm -hmm. where we were able to separate the fibers. Are you taking fibers from, the, from those streams? So what, how are you getting your clean, clean streams of fiber? We actually buy that from all over the world, uh -huh. including SIPTEX. Okay. Uh, and we have, you know, we have, we have contracts with approximately 120,000 metric tons already. So, I mean, we're, we're in a uh, quite big scale. What SIPTEX does is they are making um, uh, an automated separation technology with infrared, mm -hmm. uh, which is very encouraging and very interesting. Mm -hmm. So we're looking forward to having that more, you know, uh, pronounced. Uh, because with the new <clears throat> EU legislation that is going to come, come on stream 2025, all member states need to uh, collect textiles oh, yeah. in the same way as we do with bottles and cans and 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 yeah, uh, and uh, paper and so forth. Um, but and that all of the textile is not supposed to be put on landfill or being incinerated again. So then, then my question is, okay, well, we're going to do with all that, and we we're going to be there in order to do what we can. But it's going to be a lot of waste available, and there, you know, uh, companies like Renew Cell actually recycling these clothes and, and also uh, Siptex and other sorters will be very important. And I think it's, it's a huge industry being developed around this right now. Mm -hmm. And of course you have to make sure that this is not a huge emitter in terms of uh, chemicals, in terms of uh, energy emissions that are not clean, etc. How are you safeguarding this? Well, we, um, uh, we're building our plant. Uh, the current plant that we're building is, uh, it was for 60,000 metric tons. We're now building 120,000 tons in the city of Sundsvall in Sweden. And there we're using um, renewable energy, so Swedish hydropower. Um, we're also using chemicals that are being used in the process. Ozone, for example, it's O3. Now I'm talking a bit of chemical <laughs> language here. Um, and uh, O3 breaks down to, into oxygen. And <clears throat> And you have uh, peroxide, for example, and, and other type of, of materials. Peroxide is H2O2, so breaking down to water and, and one hydrogen. So we're using very environmentally friendly chemicals, which are being used in the, in the pulp and paper industry today. Mm -hmm. So we are uh, we're trying to walk the talk um, and do good uh, all the way. Um, so, yeah, we, there's always areas. I mean, we're using energy, yes, uh, but... Uh, we're using renewable energy and so forth. So we're really trying to make good on our promise to the brands that we have a sustainable material all the way through. So Felicia, thank you, Patrick. Uh, Felicia, in terms of consumers, you represent a huge brand. Some might say fast fashion brand, but I know you're trying to transform this into something else, uh, step by step. Uh, so. In terms of getting the consumers on board, are they willing to pay more to get, for instance, um, textile well, clothes from, that are made from recycled and renew-celled uh, factories and, 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 and textile? I would say yes and no. Mm. Uh, probably some are. Um, but I believe that the customers today, they have high expectations on brands. They expect it's more of a hygiene factor, actually, that we should take responsibility. And I believe that everything that Gwen said in the beginning, it's true. These are the responsibilities that we have to take. And we also have to make it easy for the customer to actually enjoy and experience circular fashion. And if it's repaired or if you're reusing it or reselling it, I also agree secondhand is not waste. Um, even um, a ripped <laughs> jeans are not waste. Or if it's recycled. I mean, we have to help with that and make it affordable to all customers and that they can enjoy this dress from Circloys, for example. So how about your goals from this huge uh, com company's com uh, side? How, when will you be circular, 100%? I mean, it's a long journey. Mm -hmm. We have many parts. And uh, like Gwen said, I mean, it starts with the design. We have to look at designing for circularity, that they have another purpose if you're repairing it or reusing it and so forth. And then the whole customer journey if you're reselling it. So th there are many parts and we're working with all, all aspects. And of course, then with Renew Cell, which is an important partner in this journey as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe we're we are really in a linear system still, uh, and we talked about this before. I think it really needs to speed up to become a more circular um, society, and we all have an important part to play here. 
It's, all, it's very much about values. For instance, I, I, I always wear vintage, if I can, but like 90% of my clothes, yeah. this is, for instance, vintage. Uh, and for me, it brings me joy yeah. because it, it sort of aligns with my, with my core values mm. as a person. So how can we more make this more sort of visible to the consumers that this is actually something that is going to make you mm. not just look better, but also feel better? Yeah. And I think we have a big responsibility here. And for now in Sweden, we actually have integrated on hm.com secondhand offer as well. So you can mm -hmm. see that at the same time. And I think that plays a big role that we're showing it on a commercial site as well. And we also see a lot uh, popping up in Stockholm with secondhand everywhere, I would say. But we can use our platform to actually engage with the customer when it comes to this. I also enjoy, I buy a lot from Selby actually. Mm. It looks so. like you're wearing something that might be repurposed or redesigned. Is that true? Yes, this one is, but I actually might, these are from Selby, the pants. Mm. Um, Because there are also a lot of platforms making it possible for the, the consumer to sort of sell to other consumers in different, yeah. different aspects. Uh, the circularity gap report in Sweden uh, just recently was, was recently published and we, we were I say slightly distraught to see, I'm sure you agree, 3.4% of the Swedish consumer's consumption was circular. 3.4. It's, it's a disgrace, actually, uh, and from my point of view. So how could we learn from this report? I'm turning now to Gwen. How could we, you're not Swedish, but 3.4 <laughs> is, is, is not good enough. I'm sure you can <laughs> agree with that. Uh, so how could we learn from that report and let this gap be our guide? to this transformation. How, we, how do we make people understand more the impacts and the, to realize this gap? Mm. Yeah, I'm not Swedish, <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, that's true. But I, I mean, I do believe that it, it really does start from a, a citizen's perspective. It starts with education, which is empowering. And, you know, we have, um, a challenge ahead always, I think, with bringing this message to people in a way that feels uh, inclusive and uh, simple and clear and achievable and, mm -hmm. and all of these things. You know, the circular economy, even this term, I think, can already be a barrier uh, to entry. So I, I do believe strongly that I think we need communicators also mm -hmm. always in the room um, because it is, I think, when you... Uh, when you speak to people's heart through storytelling, this is when you see real uh, change of, of mindset. Um, so I, I think that this this point of awareness can't be also, uh, can't be understated. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gwen. Stephen, you're signaling. Do you want no, to, I, to I, fill in? I yeah, think, yeah I, I just wanted to join in on, on the conversation about, I think the thing that is really amazing about fashion is that it has a unique place uh, in our landscape to be um, an inspiring place or an aspirational place. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the work that we do, for example, uh, you know, we obviously the Beyond Retro, uh, it, it, you go in, but you can also bring in old clothes in a Beyond Retro, but Beyond Retro beyond that is also part of a larger ecosystem. For example, we worked with Converse to make uh, the, uh, upper of the Chuck Taylor shoe out of post-consumer apparel. So, uh, but I feel as if, so how do we actually in, get more of the Swedes onto the circular economy? I think that the, the, the people in this room and your other panelists have a real opportunity because fashion holds a unique place in our society to be aspirational and to be a leader in this space. And, and I, I'm proud of, of, of the work, obviously, that we as a company are doing. I'm proud that last month, uh, over a million pounds of product was shipped to Renewcell from Bank of Vogue, our parent company. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the real exciting thing is that uh, companies like Beyond Retro and frankly, companies like H&M have an incredible opportunity to inspire the possibilities of the beauty of the circle. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm... I'm exuberant about this and being in the fashion space and helping with this and moving the needle on 3.46. Thank you so much, Stephen. Patrick? Yeah, I, I think what, what Stephen mentions there, I mean, uh, if we're really going to make an impact, we need to uh, really show the opportunity 
of circularity, show the opportunity of the businesses that are actually go in there. <clears throat> I, I normally, when I talk about this, I mean, circularity and sustain tech is probably one of the best business opportunity mm. that man can have ever seen. I mean, if you look at where we were in industri industrialization, if you look at what happened in when, uh, when the uh, steam train and, and railway came around, <clears throat> Sustain tech and making the world a sustainable place is going to outpace that multiple times for the simple reason that the economies are much larger today. But on top of that, sustainability is going to go through all sectors. Everything is going to, going to, going to need to, to, to adapt. And, here we, and if you look at the drive that we have today, we don't have one world leader. We don't have one CEO, okay, one or two that don't talk about circularity and how important this is and, and, and sustainability. So <clears throat> I think we also need to change our perspectives a little bit and see it that this is a fantastic business opportunity. We need more businesses driving towards sustainability, entrepreneurs like myself, but also existing businesses that is actually changing towards sustainability. And there will be a huge change in the future. And if, for, for those businesses who see this, they will actually be able to, to, to flourish and also nations will flourish. But there will also be uh, uh, companies that will perish because they don't make the change fast enough. Mm -hmm. So I think there is, there is in, in, when we talk about this and when I have been visiting all these COOP meetings, I, I feel a little bit distressed when we only talk about the problem. We should talk about the opportunity. And that is not only for fashion, but fashion is, and I agree with Stephen, it's a huge marker and a drive for, for that change. But we want to eat sustainably, drive sustainably. We want to clothe ourselves sustainably, of course. So this is a fantastic opportunity. Thank you, Patrick. And I liked what you said about aspirational, Stephen, because we, it, this is really, fashion has a, has a part to play in our creative personalities. And I think one final word that I'd like to add before we close this is, is role models. We need to talk about this. We need to, to showcase that you, can, you could be fashionable and beautiful and wear vintage secondhand, repurposed, recycled, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. So all of you watching this, if you, uh, if you buy something or recycle something, talk about it, because we need to set new standards about how we, how we, how we look at fashion. And thank you for helping us do this, all of us, all of you, Glenn, uh, Gwen, Stephen, Patrick, and uh, Felicia. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Very thank much. you. Thank you. And now this concludes this session and I'm handing over to my dear colleague, Dr. Shweta Shakarborty.